Hello aviators, Sky here, and we are going back to the time of the firsts. The long-awaited aircraft, which once had to consolidate the position of Boeing, as certainly not the first US civilian aircraft manufacturer. And today we are meeting the second jet airliner in American history, and one of the most famous products of once the leader of the aviation industry. Douglas DC-8 is a four-engine jet airliner developed by Douglas Aircraft in the 1950s one of the main passenger aircraft of its time. Let's begin our tour. This tour, as it should be with the first jet airliners, begins right after the World War II. For the aviation industry of the whole world, it was a time of change and exploration, and the United States were no exception. The competition between aviation giants was becoming more and more active. Boeing, which created the legendary B-17 and B-29 bombers, had made huge progress in the field of strategic aviation. But in the civilian world they had nothing to brag about. Their Stratoliners and Stratocruisers could hardly compete with the leaders. The leaders in civilian aviation were the Douglas DC-6, the number of which were measured in hundreds, as well as the Lockheed Constellation, which eventually became a real legend. Convair also wasn't lagging behind. Their CV-240 family was produced in hundreds and was loved by aviators. However, great success in the field of piston aircraft played a cruel joke with these companies. Having vast experience in creating such planes, as well as the manufacturing and maintenance infrastructure, they had great technological inertia that did not allow them to change quickly in the new circumstances. And the 1940s brought those circumstances, the real industrial revolution. The first sparks of this revolution in the civilian sector were the appearance of the turboprop Vickers Viscount in 1948 and the jet de Havilland Comet in 1949. Nevertheless, the Americans were still skeptical about this direction. Despite the advantages, such engines were terribly unreliable in comparison to the usual pistons. Nevertheless, it was impossible to completely ignore new trends, so the companies directed their research towards turboprop engines, hoping that they could change the power plants with minimal risk, keeping the general design of propeller aircraft. Because you have to make those crazy roaring barrels work properly before putting them on a passenger airplane. Lockheed was the first on this way, creating the L-188 Electra in the mid-1950s. Convair was lagging behind, as its main priorities were still the military programs. First of all, the recently created and extremely complex B-36 Peacemaker bomber. Douglas was not in a hurry. Piston engines were still their favorite, and in 1953 they released the DC-7 to the market. At this time, Boeing continued to actively develop the jet aircraft technology. Having created the B-47 and B-52, the company gained invaluable experience in developing not just jet planes, but large jet planes. The turning point for them was the US Air Force order for a new generation of aerial tankers. The piston KC-97 Stratofreighter could not work effectively with jet aircraft. The first ones were too slow, and the latter, on the contrary, were too fast. The implementation of the military needs was the Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker project, which was created already with a clear aim at the potential civilian application. It was obvious that Boeing had both the technology and the will to enter the modern civilian aviation market. Douglas dominated this market, and they were not going to give up their place to competitors. The first works on the subject of jet transports were started within the company in 1952. They wanted to create an 80-seat four-engine airliner capable of flying 3 to 4,000 miles, nearly 4,600 to 6,400 kilometers. Their past with Boeing crossed during the same tender for the tanker creation. However, while Boeing initially created it, planning to build a civilian modification afterwards, Douglas, on the contrary, wanted to make a tanker on the basis of a civilian airliner. However, Boeing had the technological advantage and moreover extensive experience in working with the Strategic Air Command of the US Air Force. The expectation that the military will divide the order and give it to several companies, as it was often done before, was also not justified. The whole contract was won by Boeing. Douglas could only continue to work on the civilian version. The company started a series of consultations with airlines. The DC-8 project was officially announced in 1955. Despite the rapid development of the competing Boeing 707 program, the work was carried out according to plan. Douglas was still the industry leader, and the slight lag was not considered critical. 
Although both companies were stepping up the pace of work, the British were leaders in this field. And there was information that the jet aircraft appeared in the USSR. The American press had questions to their aviators. At the same time, the company retained some skepticism regarding the choice of a jet engine. The turboprop aircraft created at the time proved to be excellent. Vickers Viscount was supplied in large quantities, and Bristol Britannia and Lockheed Electra looked very promising. The first jet aircraft overseas, although caused a sensation, but as it turns out were not as good as it seemed. The Havilland was struggling with the comet disasters, and the operation of the 2104 caused many difficulties. On the other hand, the French jet Caravelle, which took off in 1955, was inferior to Comet in a number of specifications, but looked pretty good. Finally, the ambition of airlines played to the benefit of the new aircraft generation. Yes, on one hand, the operation of jet aircraft was still difficult and risky, but on the other hand, these revolutionary machines created an image of the airline's incredible advancement. Having such a plane in the park was very cool. In the United States, Huan Trip became the main catalyst of the image game. In 1955, Pan American made an unprecedented step. It signed contracts for 20 Boeing 707 and 25 DC-8. This act provoked an explosive demand for these aircraft from the entire industry. Almost immediately, more than a dozen other large operators also placed orders for future flagships. Everyone wanted to have them. By 1958, Douglas had a portfolio of orders for 133 aircraft, and Boeing for 150. For that time, these numbers were huge. The original DC-8 production site was supposed to be the main Douglas plant in Santa Monica, California. But this factory was adopted for the piston planes, and for the jet giant, the local airport was too small. The local authorities did not allow to increase its size. Besides, the unverified giant four-engine jet plane flying in the middle of the city was not the best prospect. Production was moved to Long Beach. The basic DC-8 was the Series 10 model. The aircraft received a fuselage almost 151 feet or 46 meters long, and the cabin capacity reached 177 passengers in the standard layout of 3 plus 3 economy class and 2 plus 2 business class. However, given the important image value, airlines often played with these schemes, making them sometimes not standard. The crew was made up of three people, two pilots and a flight engineer. Due to the requirements of the FAA and a small amount of solutions in the avionics, in a number of elements, including the cockpit, the DC-8 and Boeing 707 were close to each other. Although, the DC-8 had an unusual conditioning system. The pressurization was performed through compressors with air intakes located in the front fuselage section. That is why the DC-8 has those exotic nostrils. The choice of power plant was also small. Four Pratt Whitney JT-3C turbojet engines, similar in design to Boeing 707 engines, were placed under the wing. With the takeoff mass of 273,000 pounds or 124 tons, the airliner had a flight range of almost 3,800 nautical miles or 7,000 kilometers. The ability to fly across the Atlantic was critical, although the first series was more likely built for domestic flights. The first plane passed the rollout ceremony on April 9, 1958, and made its maiden flight on May 30. A few months later, Boeing confirmed its primacy by starting deliveries of the first 707 airliners to customers. Douglas was performing the flight tests as fast as they could. Ten aircraft took part in the tests at once, and the model passed the certification in the summer of 1959. However, such haste had its price. The first aircraft were slower than planned, and some of the mechanization was not efficient enough. Deliveries began in autumn of 1959, with the transfer of the first aircraft to the fleets of Delta Airlines and United Airlines. During the following year, Douglas reached the production rate of 8 airliners per month and continued to develop the line. Soon a Series 20 model appeared, with more powerful JT-4A engines. Finally, a Series 30 airliner was created for fully transcontinental traffic. This plane was heavier because it had increased fuel capacity. Its range reached 4,000 miles or 7,400 kilometers, which made the transatlantic flights optimal. Criticism about the speed became a marketing problem for the company. Great work was launched to improve aerodynamics and increase the efficiency of the power plant. The result of this work was the Series 40. 
its airframe and mechanization became much more efficient, and the question of thrust was resolved radically by installing the newest Rolls-Royce Conway engines. The finale of the speed increasement work was reached in 1961 in a rather crazy, by modern standards, but impressive way. During one of the test flights, the plane was raised to a ceiling height and then thrown into a controlled dive with a maximum engine thrust. In 16 seconds of this madness, the aircraft accelerated to a speed of about Mach 1.012. Oh yeah, this extravagant test made the Douglas DC-8 airliner the world's first civilian aircraft to break the sound barrier. And it was done on a serious aircraft, and not only by psycho testers, but also by the badass PR management. A bonus to advertising was also the fact that the DC-8 at its peak was accompanied by the F-104 Starfighter, one of the fastest planes of the time. Like that wasn't enough, this jet fighter was piloted by Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier in 1947, a living legend, a future Air Force general, as well as one of the fathers of the first generation of astronaut teams in the Mercury and Gemini programs. Ok, let's return to our aircraft. The DC-8's advertising was excellent, but specifically the Series 40 was not a success in the United States. American operators didn't want to buy a plane with British engines, and the Pratt Whitney JT-3D, developed shortly after, were very good, which made it preferable for further upgrades and the creation of the Series 50 airliners in 1961. These planes had several versions with different ranges, besides, they were the first to receive the Jet Trader cargo version, which had certain popularity. But they did not get rid of the main drawback. Differing in takeoff masses and fuel capacity, the Douglases in fact had the same airframes, with the same passenger capacity, which limited the diversity of the park, while the competitors from Seattle were already offering their planes in different versions at once. This led to the fact that some airlines refused the offer of DC-8 in favor of Boeing and Conveyor models. By the mid-1960s, demand began to drop. In 1965, being in a critical situation for the program, Douglas announced the DC-8 modification with more radical solutions. The Super 60 series airlines were made up of three main modifications. The DC-8 Series 61 had a stretched fuselage, its capacity reached 259 people, which was the largest indicator among all the passenger aircraft until the appearance of the Boeing 747. The DC-8 Series 62 was the long-range version. Its fuselage was shortened, but due to improvements in systems and a larger fuel capacity, it had a range of 5200 miles, or 9600 kilometers. The DC-8 Series 63 was the final third model, which appeared in 1968. The aircraft received a Model 61 fuselage, Model 62 innovations and updated engines. The plane was the most complex and heavy, but with a capacity of 259 people, it flew on a range of 4000 miles, or 7400 kilometers. These projects, becoming a fully realized family and giving airlines the long-awaited flexibility in operation, became a second birth for the program and made it possible to return the interest of many customers. But the inventors didn't end there, of course, as time went on and demands grew. Another problem of the DC-8 was the high level of noise, especially in large city airports and hubs where these birds were buzzing day and night. The first to start complaining were the residents of the glorious city of New York, and the city developed restrictions on the noise level in areas of their airports. This led to the fact that the operators had to reduce the payload and the amount of fuel to keep the engines at less noisy modes on takeoffs and landings. At the beginning, this concerned only the Big Apple and several other large cities. But, by the 1970s, restrictions began to spread around the world, which had become a real headache for the airlines. Their outrage was heard in 1975, when McDonnell Douglas, along with General Electric, began to work on updating the power plant. The result of their work was the modification of the aircraft and the installation of the new CFM-56 engines, the very engines that later appeared under the wings of many thousands of single-aisle airliners. The updated family received the name DC-8 Super 70. Model 71, 72 and 73 technically became the re-engined versions of the models 61, 62 and 63 respectively. The Super 70 series had become a great success for the company. The noise level in the area immediately fell by 70%. The DC-8 from the most loud turned into the most quiet. 
In addition, the new CFM56 were 23% more economical than the old engines, which reduced fuel costs and increased flight range. Over the entire period of operation of 556 DC-8 aircraft, 146 aviation incidents occurred to them. 83 were disasters with the death of over 2,200 people. This indicator is, of course, painful, but unfortunately most of the first-generation airliners had similar indicators. The DC-8 and Boeing 707 competition lasted, in fact, throughout their lives. But ironically, rematurization on the CFM-56, one of the most popular modern engines, made the DC-8 a long-lived plane. If the 707 remained mostly in the military, the DC-8 continued to be very actively operated on commercial routes. The 21st century met about 200 flying planes, and this is despite the fact that they were no longer produced since 1972. But time, of course, has no mercy. In 2018, a bit more than a dozen aircraft of cargo versions remained in operation, and their service is coming to an end. Douglas DC-8 slowly leaves the sky and occupies a worthy place among the legends of aviation. That concludes the story of this legendary aircraft. Like the video and subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.